I am uh, David Scare, and I teach at Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And uh, we're going to be looking this uh, at Matthew 5, 13 to, um, to 20. Uh, this is part of the Sermon on the Mount. Um, in comparison with last year and other years, we might not be going this far into uh, the Epiphany season, but Easter comes late, and so uh, Ash Wednesday comes late, and it uh, it's it's it, it has its advantages because we get to look at the Sermon on the Mount. Now, so far as the Sermon on the Mount is concerned, is uh, I have a book here. See, the Sermon on the Mount is perhaps one of the most is the most frustrating section in the Gospels, and for evidence of this. Here is a book called Sermon on the Mount Through the Centuries, put out by Brazos Press, which is a, a subsidiary of, I believe, Baker. And uh, if you're looking for a, one, a once and for all interpretation of the Sermon on the Mount, you're not going to get it. And uh, uh, Luther himself uh, floundered all over the place with this thing. And as you know, I hold that the Sermon on the Mount is chiefly the gospel. And this book may, it's still in print from Concordia Publishing House. It may be of some assistance. The Sermon on the, on the Mount, the church's first statement of the gospel. Now the phrases from the Sermon on the Mount appear everywhere, generally in a disconnect, in a general disconnected way. I think it's a brilliant piece of work. And... Um, to start off, by the way, we I want to read it in English uh, simply so that we get the flow of the of the words, the flow, because it is it is difficult to handle. I, I am not so sure that using uh, the classical Lutheran method of law and gospel is going to be a, uh, really of that much assistance. Uh, you are we're going to read from 13. We're going to read from 13 through 20 in the English. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trodden under men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hid, nor do men light a lamp, put it under a bushel, but on a stand, and it gives light to all the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Think not that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Whoever then releases, uh, relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of the heaven. But he who does them and teaches them shall be called great in the kingdom of the heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and righteousness, the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. You have heard that it was said to men of old, you shall not kill, and whoever kills shall be uh, liable to the judgment. But I say to you, that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be liable for the judgment. Whoever insults his brother shall be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, shall be liable to the hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift, I guess that's as far as it goes. We can do the rest the next time. Uh, this really presents a lot of material. Now, it's, it's absolutely necessary that before you approach this section of the Sermon on the Mount, that you have a full, of, as possible, understanding of the Beatitudes. And um, the, uh, many of you know how I think about the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes <coughs> are, Christ, are statements about Christ, which are then applicable to all those who are in Christ. It's in the plural, but um, these are descriptions, first of Christ, 
and of the, of the life that Christ lives. Um, the reference to Jesus going up unto the mountain, by the way, is a reference to, uh, is a, is a, a clear uh, the, a reference back to Moses going up to Sinai to get uh, the law from God. The only thing that's different is here is that Jesus does not get the law from anybody because he himself is God. That is intended by, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Now, <clears throat> the, the first beatitude and the last of the eighth beatitude are, are to be understood together because it says blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of the heavens and then it goes on in 10 verse 10 blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake for their uh, uh, for theirs is the kingdom of the heavens it's really too bad I am using the old RSV and I don't have the NIV or the EVS or whatever the translations are coming out. That's the way I was brought up on. It's kind of hard to teach a, an old dog new tricks. Maybe you can. But um, the translation is not accurate. It is the kingdom of the heavens, not the kingdom of heaven singular. It has a, it has a definite meaning that applies to... Not, it, doesn't refer, it doesn't refer to the church. It doesn't refer to believers. It refers to Jesus in particular, Jesus primarily, uh, totally, and then it applies to those who are in Jesus. The phrase is going to reappear in the parables. Um, in the first beatitude, blessed are the poor in spirit, is, is, uh, is uh, explained in verse 10, the eighth beatitude, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. Righteousness here, righteousness does not mean moral righteousness. It means the righteousness of God that appears in Jesus. It's the, it's the righteousness which is different from all other kinds of righteousness. Now, uh, from verse 10 to 11, there is a switch. All of a sudden in verse 11, it says, blessed are you. And uh, second person, plural, while in the, old, in the uh, eight Beatitudes, it's in the third person, plural. Blessed are they, blessed are the poor, blessed are those who mourn, and so forth. And, um, but verse 11 continues, is based upon verse 10. Men will revile and persecute you uh, and say all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. So that explains. Now we come to verse 13, which has really been, well, notice it says, you are, the, you are the salt of the earth, you, 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 right? You are the salt of the earth. And people have tried to explain this in, ma in many ways. You know, the, um, the easiest way to say it is that Christians make, um, make the earth uh, delightful because uh, salt enhances the flavor of the food. Now, I, that, makes a, that makes for a good sermon illustration because the people can immediately comprehend it. And the second one, for those of you who are, uh, or, uh, you are still into canning and preservatives, and uh, back there on the farm, uh, the way the meat was smoked and salted, that was they, without refrigerated. So you could say that uh, because of Christian God preserves the world. And that's all very nice. The only thing is that it doesn't fit the thing. It's bit, the salt is a reference to the salt used in sacrifice. You are the salt of the earth. You shall be sacrificed for the sake of others, even for the sake of the unbelievers. Now, if that's the correct interpretation... It would expand. The reason that we went through the Beatitudes briefly is because the Beatitudes have to do with the persecution of Christ, his crucifixion, and the persecution of the, Christ, of the church. I, I think all the evidences point this way, that the, sermon, that the Gospel of Matthew is written 
to a church that has intimately known persecution among its members and that uh, it knows the death of Stephen, it knows the death of James, it may know the death of other people. It's an extension of the story of the crucifixion of Jesus. And the evangelist here picks this up and he says, if you're not willing uh, to be sacrificed, then you're no good. Now, if you want to go against the prosperity Christianity that I guess is exemplified by Joel Osteen, and um, I guess you know more than anybody else how our members are attracted to that because it's, a t it's called the prosperity Christianity because it completely turns the message of the gospel around that um, the way uh, the gospel can assure you the uh, financial success and success in other ways. And it says, if you're not willing to do that, then you're going to just be thrown out. When it says you'll be thrown out to be trodden underfoot, that refers to how the ancient world was. That you wanted to get rid of the refuse in the house, you simply threw it out the window. And then it was trodden on. You are the light of the world. Now, that brings up the concept of how Christians are a benefit to to the world. Um, um, Luke has a slightly different version of that, but uh, I, we, uh, he says, um, he, he, gives, he renders that, those words in a different sense, and that is, the light of the world is not just doing um, uh, charitable works. It certainly includes that. But it is really the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He is the light of the world. And uh, the great good work is the proclamation of who Jesus is. And when they see what, you, uh, what you're saying about Jesus, they join, those, they join you in giving thanks to, to, uh, to God. Now, I found one statistic to be of, of, of some interest. Uh, we're facing a declining population in the Lutheran Church, regardless of the synod, whatever it is. We're, we're, we're holding our own. And uh, we have, might have a tendency by the, to, um, to admonish our people that they're not doing enough in the area of evangelist. For the record, we are doing better or just as good or better than the so-called evangelistic uh, groups. One statistic that is overlooked that while those churches do blossom out into large congregations, there is no staying power in those churches. And I do this, I mention this for only one reason, that the people, our people are pretty good in uh, bringing others into the church. Now we're up against it um, because the, the world is, I've been around for just a little while but the world is not, the world is much, when I was, as a younger person, the church was, the world was not as secular as it is today. It is hugely secular. And that uh, even th those who have reached the ages of 60 and 70 are often not members of the church as they were in previous years. So we don't even have grandparents to do it. I, I mention this as a way of, of encouragement to the people rather than admonishing them for doing, uh, for doing what they are not doing. They are, in fact, doing it. Now, the passage 17, um, 17 uh, and following, is, um, well, with any part of the Sermon on the Mount, it's up to you how you're going to preach. And that in a, these are all, these are all one section is related to another. But at the same time, each one of these sections can provide a sermon by itself. And um, depending on uh, how long you think the sermon should be, um, you can take one of these things, one of these thoughts, the idea of, um, uh, the, uh, the idea of persecution, or... Uh, uh, or, or the idea of sh showing your good works. Now, this is not a law and gospel situation. It's simply a description of what Christians do. Christians do these kind of things. 
Now comes a most significant passage in verse 17. We're actually moving over into biblical authority. What exactly is the church based upon? So Jesus says here in 17, Do not think that I have come to loose the law or the prophets, but I have come not to loose them, but to fulfill them. Now that needs a little of attention. Because you can see the word here, kata, uh, we are in verse 17 right here, right? Let's take a look at this. You got the word leo, which means right there. You got the word leo right there. Kata intensifies it. And you do have the division here between the Old Testament and into law and prophets, Moses and the rest. There's no reason this can't be included in the sermon because many people just don't know that. But here comes the, uh, here comes the uh, controlling word to fulfill them. Now this is not simply a matter of fulfilling this or that messianic prophecy. No, that's not at all. He has come as the answer to the entire Old Testament right here. Without Christ, the Old Testament is not understood. And even before the coming of Jesus, they did not know to which, uh, to which person uh, the, the, the prophets were speaking to. And here Jesus claims to be, this is a claim to messianic ship. This is a claim to be the Messiah. I have come to fulfill them. And then he says, uh, truly I say to you, Till heaven and earth passes away, an iota or a tot shall absolutely, double negative here, not go away, erkamai, par erkamai, from the law. Now, if you took it like that, it would seem like the law and the prophets would remain there forever. However, this changes it because it says, until, until all things are fulfilled. Now, Jesus here is speaking of his own work. The law and the prophets, by his fulfillment, will pass away in the sense that they will be understood in an entirely different way. So there's a, there's a, there's a difference in the way we Lutherans look at the Old Testament and the way the evangelicals look at the Old Testament. They believe that any section in the Old Testament is immediately accessible to them so that they can understand it. Well, in a sense, that's absolutely true. However, without Christ, you do not get the intent. I just won't say the full intent, but the complete intent of what that is, uh, of what all those passages means. Now, here you come a question. I'm going to tell you ahead of time what this passage is going to be. This passage here, this section here, is going to be at the ministry. The apostles have the task of teaching. You'll notice the word didache. It's a verb, didasco. The noun is didache, which means doctrine, dogmatics. Whoever loses one of the least of these and, teach, and teaches men otherwise, he shall be called least in the kingdom of the heavens. Now, whoever does them. Now, by the way, this is not an opportunity to say, well, we can't do all of the commandments of God and Jesus, and nevertheless, we're saved by faith. That does not belong here. He shall be called great in the kingdom of the heavens. Now, certainly it is Jesus who does and teaches all things. This, this, I would take this passage here as a reference to, uh, to, the gospel, to the gospel of Matthew in its entirety. And that is, what Jesus says qualifies as entole, this, that's the plural, the noun is entole. Now this is not a law gospel matter. The word entole means commands. It doesn't mean commands in a threatening sense. 
It means command in the sense that the one who speaks these words has authority to do it. Thus, for example, if you're commanded by the king to come to a, uh, to a feast, uh, th that does not fit under the, really fits under the concept of gospel. The word entele refers to the person who speaks this thing, who speaks the word, not necessarily to the content. Here, by ex here this refers to all the words that Jesus speaks, and in this context to the words that the evangelist has included in his gospel, and by extension to the entire New Testament. Now, here, here we see the different, here we see the institution of the ministry. Every pastor knows that his people will have certain, I, uh, certain ideas about Christian doctrine which are just not quite right. There was a young man, and we had a, a, a conversation with him, a, a, nice, a, a significant clergy person, about he was going to make sure that his congregation knew all it would be absolutely orthodox, right down the line. Okay, I'm not so sure that really ever happens. And certainly that's not the reference here. The reference here is to the one who teaches. He is the one who is expected to get everything right. Let's get, see right here. Whoever breaks one of these commandments, and, and it's, in the, it's in the role of, t and teaches, this is it right here. Now, there comes, uh, there comes the one thing is that, uh, obviously I'm standing here at the seminary, Concordia Theological Seminary. What a seminary is, I believe, is remote uh, to, the, uh, to, to, to most of the people in the congregations of our synod. Uh, there's no reason that if, when I go to the doctor that I have to know the medical, I don't know what medical institutions he studied. I can look at the diplomas on the wall. I can look at them and I will uh, immediately forget them. That does not belong to the uh, cure of the body. Um, and the same thing is true about the, when we deal with our people. They do not have to be intimately detailed, given detailed instruction of how we got to be clergy person. They don't need that. Um, and so, but the, the issue of where do pastors come from? It's like asking a child, a child asking, where, where does my baby brother come? And you say the stalk and you kind of leave it like that. There has to be an, the, the seminary, the teach, the, the, the institution of the ministry, that is that we take certain men to prepare them for the ministry is a divine activity. And that we do this in groups is a divine activity. And that the study should be difficult and excruciating is necessary. And it all hangs in this word didache, right here. There it is. It's, the word is going to appear again in Matthew 28, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Now, it is difficult for the pastor to talk about himself. Uh, this might be the Sunday in which to do it, at least to talk about the ministry, what is involved, and what are the requirements. Now, they, I have heard a lot of, you know, there is, a number of years ago, a vice president of the Synod said to me, well, Dave, I heard you say that there's going to be a special place uh, at the day of judgment for the, for the, for the ministers. I said, you didn't say that. I said, I certainly said that. Because it says it right here. This one, this one shall be called Megos. Megalomania. Megaphone. He shall be called, passive by the way, great in the kingdom of the heavens. And you know, you know directly from your own experience that when a pastor dies in office, that's very traumatic for the congregation. You know from your own experience that when a congregation, when a pastor leaves the congregation to accept another call or assignment, that is a very traumatic 
uh, experience for the congregation because they depend on him. The pastor has to know what he is doing. And all this is contained here in that word. Now here comes the question. The Luke, a typical way to understand the final verse here, unless you're righteousness, it's a good Lutheran term, isn't it? Is more than that of the scribes and the Pharisees. Strange, it doesn't say. You will absolutely never, look at this, double negative. Enter into the kingdom of the heavens. Uh, 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 for a long time, uh, I, I thought, that uh, well, I think many of us thought that this is a reference, that um, this is really a preaching of the law in the sense that your righteousness had better be good as the scribes and Pharisees. And they had excellent righteousness, doing all kinds of things. So you work and work at doing all the righteous things, all the good works. Oh, I'm not doing them, and I know I'm not doing them. Aha, uh -huh. don't worry, Christ has died for you. That's not what the passage means. It means unless your, your righteousness is of a completely different kind of the scribes and Pharisees. Now, one example, I, I don't know if you want to really use it, but if you want to see something that resembles the Jewish righteousness of the Pharisees in our, at our time, it would be the ascetic Jews. They have all kinds of little dinky regulations, and in that regulations, in fulfilling those regulations, they find themselves to be pleasing God. That's not what it says. And also in this, reading in Calvin, Calvin set up the city of Geneva. So he saw himself doing all kinds of good, busy works. Um, this, this was the assurance to Calvin, because he didn't have the sacraments to assure him of salvation, that this was really, a, this was, they were really Christians. And uh, boy, that mentality catches on among some of us, but that's not what it says. Hey, you have a lot to work on for this Sunday in preaching. Um, I wouldn't say it's a lot of fun. If, if you want to take a look at what I have to say on the Sermon on the Mount, comes, I think it's still available from CPH. And uh, look at it. If you can take exception to it, uh, that's, of course, that's, even, that's, a, that's your privilege. And that's what makes theology and preaching so enjoyable. So you have some good material. Thank you very much, and the best to you.